This is Boom Bust, and these are the stories that we're tracking for you today. Coming up, Gerald Salente, author, blogger, and publisher of the Trends Journal, is live on today's show. You won't want to miss what he has to say about the U.S. economy. Plus, the latest on the Herbalife Ackman Pyramid drama. This week, the FTC is being forced to look into allegations that the company has won big old pyramid scheme. We'll tell you all about it coming right up. And Ed Harrison joins me in today's big deal to talk about Canada buying land from the U.S. to build a bridge to Detroit. True story. It's really happening. You won't want to miss it, and it all starts right now. talking about the emerging markets crisis and U.S. economy. However, I want to lead off with the latest drama surrounding nutritional supplement distributor Herbalife. Now, the head of the Federal Trade Commission, Edith Ramirez, has agreed to meet with minority and consumer activists to hear their concerns about the pyramid scheme. Excuse me, excuse me, company. I meant to say company, Herbalife. It's a company. Now, Herbalife, the pyramid drama, it's already the stuff of legends thanks to an impromptu televised verbal brawl between investors Bill Ackman and Carl Icahn. Now, Ackman has been shorting Herbalife and calling the company a pyramid scheme for well over a year. However, Carl Icahn, along with some other big name hedge fund honchos like George Soros and Dan Loeb, they've taken the other side of the bet and done much, much better. Herbalife shares rose 6% in early trading Monday after the company said it increased its share repurchase program from $500 million to $1.5 billion. Herbalife considers itself a multi-level marketer and strongly denies allegations that it's a pyramid scheme. The FTC says, quote, a company can be considered a pyramid scheme if its distributors make more money from recruitment than from selling products to consumers outside the network. Senator Ed Markley sent, the letter, sent a letter to the FTC last week asking them to investigate Herbalife. And according to Brent Wilkes, executive director of the League of United Latin American Citizens, more than a dozen activists from around the country will be meeting with Ramirez in Washington on Wednesday. Now, the Ramirez meeting is just the latest in efforts by critics of Herbalife to pressure regulators into investigating the company. But what I want to know is this. What is the holdup? Seriously, FTC, why all the love for Herbalife? Why? Serious investors are telling us it's a pyramid scheme. Kind of like serious investors were telling us that Bernie Madoff's company was also a pyramid scheme. Or excuse me, a, a Ponzi scheme. Totally different, right? Right? Why is the government in no rush to look into these things? Could it perhaps have to do with their preoccupation with keeping up asset prices? I'm just saying, serious people are making serious allegations, and it's time to seriously investigate. Well, there you have it. Team Ackman all the way. right here in America with the latest economic and financial news. Now, the Federal Reserve wants to start tapering its asset purchase program in December. It started already, rather, in December, and this is even before the new Fed chair, Janet Yellen, had a chance to get in her seat. Yeah, true story. She got in her seat today, though. Now, in the wake of the Fed's tapering, yields in the U.S. have gone down, not up. And one would have expected them to do the opposite thing. An emerging market crisis is being talked about Everywhere, and everyone's talking about it. So the question is, what is going on here? Our next guest, Gerald Salente, there he is, author and trend forecaster extraordinaire, plus publisher of the Trends Journal, is here with us to make sense of these latest events. Now, welcome back to the show, Gerald. First and foremost, what do you know? The Fed has tapered twice now. That's the first question, but well, the first statement rather. But were you surprised that the Fed decided it was going to taper its QE program in December instead of in January when it announced back in December? I thought they would hold the announcement until after the Christmas holiday, not to rattle the markets. But uh, so in effect, they really did. They made the announcement, but they didn't begin their first round of tapering until, um, of course, January. And now, of course, they announced another round of tapering. 
But no, we, we had forecast they were going to do it. We took Bernanke uh, at his word when they announced it late May and, and June in 2013. They have to stop this scheme. Uh, the only reason the global equity markets have grown is because of all the cheap money flowing in. And it's not only the United States. It's the ECB. It's China. They're all pumping up their economies with cheap dough. Now, interest rates have not, I repeat, not gone up. Why do you think this is, despite the tapering? I expect them to go up. Uh, I believe they're going to have to go up. You can't keep interest rates at zero for so long and not have them edge up because the cost of money is going to be more expensive. And it's already happening in the emerging markets. I mean, you see what's going on in Turkey. They said for, you know, for months they weren't going to raise interest rates. And I don't know the exact number. But it went along something like maybe it was at 7.5 and all of a sudden, you know, 12 percent. I mean, they really jacked it up. Again, I'm not sure the exact number. It was much higher, though, than is normally done. And they've done the same thing in India, same thing in, in, in um, uh, 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 South Africa. They're doing it all over. Now, Aaron, you don't have to be a, a genius to figure this one out. Your economies are going down. Business stinks. you got to run on your money. And now you're going to raise interest rates to protect your currency. Perfect. You'll slow down the economy, and you'll make a bad situation much worse. The same thing is going to have to happen in the United States. Now, I want to move on to the ISM manufacturing report, which came out just today and showed that the U.S. is on the verge of a fall in manufacturing activity. Now, today it was 51.3, down from 56.5 in December. And this weakness, it came as a big surprise to many. And you and I, when we spoke back in November, you indicated that you saw problems for the U.S. by March. Do you still feel this way? Oh, yeah, yeah, by March. And it's already happening. I mean, look at the global equity markets. I, oh, no, well, let me change the story. I've been watching, uh, you know, the, uh, the mainstream business story. So I'll say to you, you know, Aaron, I think this is a buying opportunity out there. <laughs> The fundamentals of the economy are sound. You know, we need confidence. I mean, that's what they're all saying. You look at the numbers, what happened with the Christmas holiday sales. It was the worst Christmas since, well, like, 2008. You're looking at the employment numbers that came out in December. Well, you know, they'll, let's forget about them. Only 7, 74,000 jobs were created. And then again, the tapering, you, the only reason this economy has been sustained, everybody in the business knows it, is because of the cheap money they funneled into the system that only went to the equity markets. You know the numbers. What is it, 85 people? 85 people have more money than half the world's population? This is the greatest um, no one's ever seen anything like this in the world, where this kind of cheap money has been pumped in. It's scary. Now, do you think the economy will fail without Fed stimulus? That's the next question. It's failed with Fed stimulus. You know, I, I have a story here from the New York Times. They call themselves the paper of record. I finally, fondly call them the toilet paper of record, or to use my old Bronx dialect, the toilet paper of record. The middle class is steadily eroding. Just ask the business world. Front page story. Ask the business world, hey, how about asking the real world? Do you know what's going on in everybody's life out there? A, an extremely cold winter. People are making the decision, am I going to eat? Am I going to heat my home? Look at the numbers that are the real numbers of, of people that are out of work, that have fallen out of the, out of the uh, employment data scheme, so they don't count them as unemployed anymore. When we lose 347,000 people, and now they bring the employment rate down, and they say, oh, your unemployment's only at 6.7%. I mean, this is, this, is, this is unheard of. So in the real world, when you look at median household income, it's below 1999 levels. There is no recovery. The, Fed, the tapering is going to make a bad situation worse. There's panic on the streets. They're rolling out every shill that they can to say 
things are fine. This is a buying opportunity. And by the way, they pulled the same scheme when Bernanke announced the blueprint for tapering back in June. All of a sudden, the markets are diving. Man, they rolled out one cat after another, from the brilliant Larry Summers right up and down to Jamie Legg's diamond, right, the right. Goldman Sachs gang, one after another. Now, speaking of panic on the street, uh, just today, the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry told U.S. senators that Obama's softer Syria policy is collapsing and that a tougher approach it may be needed. Are we being prepared for war as a means of distracting us from the downturn in the economy? What do you think? I've written about this for years. When all else fails, they take you to war. You know, I have the, the, the top trends of 2013, a year ago. The top one was war. They do this all the time. You have sociopaths and, and, and psychopaths in charge. I don't say that as a throwaway line. They're going to get tougher with Syria? What, what strategy are they going to use? Oh, the Iraq strategy? Brilliant. Oh, how about the Afghan strategy? Now that was a winner. Oh, I got one for you. How about a time-limited, scope-limited kinetic action, we'll call it, the beautiful job they did in Libya that's destabilized the area and caused the civil war? You know, I'm an American. I want to make this 100% clear. I believe in what this country was founded upon. And the founding fathers, among them General Eisenhower, or, uh, General Washington, a real man that fought, not like these chicken hawks with their big mouths and never fought a day in their lives, at his farewell address, he tells the American people, no foreign entanglements. Could you imagine Kerry or Obama or Bush or the Clintons going to George Washington <laughs> and saying, hey, George, you're full of baloney. I know what's best. And the rest of you founding fathers, you don't know what's good for this country either. Don't you know who I am? It's, it's kind of unbelievable. And no, I could, not, I could not see that. But Gerald, don't go anywhere. We love you and we want you to stick around. But we have to take a quick break. But you stick around, too, out there in TV land, because when we come back, more with Gerald Salente. Plus, in today's big deal, Ed Harrison and I discuss the dodgy land deal going on right now between the U.S. and Canada. You won't want to miss it. But as we head to a quick break, here's a look at some of today's closing numbers at the Bell. Stick around. Spirit travels with the flame from its birthplace in Greece. Join James Brown for an elemental and epic journey around Russia and beyond. In 2010, one of the first things released by WikiLeaks was a secret video recording that actually looked like a video game showing two American Apache helicopters opening fire on a dozen people in Iraq. This is what it means to live in a society where images of violence have become normalized. This is what desensitization and lack of empathy look like. When we turn an experience into a spectacle, when we disassociate our own embodied actions, from an activity. We also absent ourselves from certain kinds of moral investment. I absolutely am frightened of the potential of games to desensitize people. We know they can because the military uses games and simulations to desensitize people. The reality of war is not simply shooting, but it is killing, and killing that exacts a penalty of the killer. 
and people for whom war is defined by popular media don't get that. with more from publisher of the Trends Journal, Gerald Salente. Gerald, I want to dive right into it. Now, the Fed's tapering of asset purchases has brought imbalances to the emerging market. It's brought them to light, actually. Why do you think we're starting to have an emerging market crisis today? Well, what happened was, Aaron, you were getting money very cheaply, and then you bring it over to emerging market, and you get higher interest rates on it, and it's easier to invest it there. So it's the hot money. It's the carry trade. So all of this hot money flowed into the emerging markets. And now, when they announce the tapering, that hot money's not going to flow in. That's why it's all flowing out. And that's why they're losing it in the emerging markets. There, again, this thing was pumped up. It was, you mentioned Bernie Madoff earlier on. I mean, we could call, uh, you know, maybe Bernie Madoff and Ben Bernanke, you know, maybe <laughs> they were cousins or something, because that's all this was. <laughs> You know, another form of, of making something up with nothing to substantiate it. So that's why the emerging markets are suffering. It's a very simple formula, by the way. If the United States and Europe aren't buying, then China, Vietnam, Indonesia, they're not making things. If they're not making things, then all of these other countries, like whether it's Australia, Chile, Brazil, Bolivia, all these natural resource-rich countries, they're not selling anything. So that's why I'm saying right. this whole thing was pumped up. It's a fraud. It's the greatest monetary fraud in world history. No one, no one anywhere, anytime, any place could show a comparison of anything that was done by the, like this again in, in the world. And by the way, this whole Federal Reserve, that's a scam in itself. I talked about the founding fathers. All, most of the elections in all of the 1800s were to prohibit a central bank from taking over the system. Mm -hmm. And they did it. This is a private organization. Everybody knows that. You know, as, the, as people say, you know, the Federal Reserve is as federal as Federal Express. <laughs> this is a private group. Now, Gerald, first and foremost, i got to tell you, you got to learn to form an opinion here. Really, none. <laughs> this is okay, fantastic I'm stuff. But, but I want to actually move on to when the, the, when the Fed, which, as you say, is a, a private institution, and, and they admit it themselves, initiated QE. When the Fed started QE, the Fed and central banks from other developed economies, they dropped rates to record lows, and cheap money then flowed into emerging markets. At that time, Brazil's finance minister talked of a currency war. Was, that was the first time we heard mumblings. Now, the money is streaming out, and investors are yanking money from emerging market investment funds. That's what's happening today. Question is, are we having a currency war today? Different than the one he was talking about, uh, because now they're trying to protect their currency as well. It's not the currency war that Mantega was really referring to. But yes, it is a currency war in some aspect in the sense that they have to raise their interest rates to protect their currencies. But again, we, I guess you could look at uh, uh, the currency war would be with um, Japan, with Abenomics, brilliant scheme again. Yeah, again, as I said, they did the same thing all over the world, you know, dumping literally trillions of yen into the system to pump it up, increasing the money supply. So what did it do? Well, it, again, the only ones that benefited from it are the equity markets. The equity market went up 57%. But then, since it hit its high in December, now it is, quote, officially in bear market territory. So they tried to depreciate the value of their yen so they could export more product. That's the kind of currency war that Montego was talking about. Gerald, you're, you're basically writing my questions here. Thank you so much, because my I was going to bring up Japan next. Now, I wanted to ask you, did the Japanese then start the, uh, the latest round of currency wars 
which is having such a dramatic impact on the emerging markets today. Is it their fault then if it's not ours? It's it's really the mo it's it's the money junkies' fault. It's 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 the banking scheme, and they're all just trying to play the game within it. And again, everything that Abenomics has done has not created the economy that he promised. And by the way, as I say, when all else fails, they take you to war. Look how they keep instigating the war talk with China and Japan. You heard Abe at the Davos meeting banging the war drum. You saw what he did. He went to the shrine where they have war criminals buried to give them another you know, shot. They privatized the, they bought the islands that are in dispute. And now, of course, China has retaliated. So again, these are all failing policies. And what they do is they then bang the drum for nationalism. Now, you've talked about America as descending into Mussolini-style corporatism. Can you provide some examples um, that exemplify this? Four words. This is not capitalism. Four words proved it. Too big to fail. In capitalism, there's no such thing. Okay. Who did we bail out? The corporations, the big banks, financial institutions, industries. By definition, a paisano, Mussolini, the merger of state and corporate powers. It's a multinational takeover at every level. You were talking before about hedge funds, private equity groups, vulture capitalists. This did not exist when I was a young man. Mm. Everything has been deregulated to put all the powers into the corporation. Oh, I mentioned it again. This isn't, you know, this isn't uh, an opinion. This is a fact. Who was the guy that created the too big to fail movement? Oh, that was. Uh, Henry Paulson, yes, yes. Where was he from? Ah, oh, the Goldman, Gacks, <laughs> uh, Goldman Sachs gang. Oh, and who was the guy that put in motion the deregulation of the killing the Glass-Steagall Act that would have prevented the bankers from becoming the bandits they, they, they became? Oh, wasn't that, um, oh, what's his name? The guy was also from Goldman Sachs. They couldn't even find another guy. You know, it's like yeah, insult to under injury. under the Clinton administration, <laughs> uh, the name escapes me. I know exactly what he looks like. Um, anyway, it's the Goldman Sachs gang. Uh. It's, who's, the head of the, who's the head of the European Central Bank, Draghi, managing director of the Goldman Sachs gang? There, there you, you have, have it. one after another. Who's the head of the Bank of England? Mark Carney. Carney, by the way, is the abbreviation for a carnival man. He's also a former Goldman Sachs guy. And it's not only Goldman Gerald. Sachs. It's all of the banks. Gerald, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're running out of time. I'm getting yelled at to, to go, but you have to come back, and we love hearing from you. You're always entertaining and always insightful. That was Gerald Salente, author, blogger, and publisher of the Trends Journal. Time now for today's Big Deal. Harrison joins me now to talk dodgy deals, specifically municipal ones. Now, here's what's happening in Muni land these days. Now, in Detroit, where we just recently saw the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history, the federal government is going to buy land. But not the U.S. federal government, huh? Tricked you. It's the Canadian federal government that's doing all the buying. And apparently, the Canadian government is going to start buying land in Detroit to make way for the U.S. side of a new bridge linking Canada to the U.S. Now, the move is intended to circumvent opponents of the project and put an end to delays caused by U.S. federal government's holdup in allocating money for the project. Now, there were some lengthy commercials just last night during the Super Bowl touting Detroit. Uh, it was just as a great city or a great city to be. And now Canada is buying into the city, potentially buying condemned properties in a ghost town-like area of Detroit. Ed, good or bad news for the city of Detroit? What do you say? Well, I think it's, it's good news for Detroit in a way. As you were saying, it's a ghost town. The area, you know, the, the, they're buying land in an area that is a ghost town. Uh, you know, it used to have as many as 30,000 people. Now there are only 3,000 people that, that are That's in that crazy. particular area. 
and so they're buying up the land. But here's the problem. One, they're a foreign government. Uh, and two, apparently, uh, from the reports that I've seen, they're condemning or they're trying to get people uh, who are actually resident in, the, in, the, uh, in their homes there, trying to get their homes condemned so that they can take them. So not everyone is on board with this. So, so when you were talking about the opponents, right. you know, those are people who actually are living in, in homes in the area, and a foreign government is sure. going to somehow forcibly remove them. I find that very bizarre. It seems illegal, if you will. But, right. um, you know, it also begs the question, this bridge is going to create jobs. They tend to do that. <laughs> Construction projects, massive ones. Shouldn't Detroit be kind of excited? Yeah, I would think that they would be excited, and especially given the, that they were the largest bankruptcy in the, uh, in the, uh, in the municipal uh, bond world. So you would expect uh, that it's going to bring more Canadians over to shop in Detroit or in Detroit suburbs, and that's going to actually uh, create jobs even beyond the construction period. Now, I want to move on from Detroit and move to Puerto Rico. Now, this is pretty incredible. Um, in Puerto Rico, the word is the country is preparing to offer investors some $2 billion of debt in the coming weeks. Now, the interesting bit is that the debt could yield as much as 10%. And since interest from Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican bonds are triple tax exempt, meaning they're exempt from local, state, and federal taxes, pretty good. That's 15% for the kind of high net worth investors that like municipal bonds. Ed, is Puerto Rico just a tax haven? I'm just going to go straight there. Is it? What's going on? Well, it does seem that way because basically, you know, we're talking about 15% of the income that's coming due uh, in Puerto Rico. If you didn't get this money, basically, yeah. from this, this huge tax hike, and, and as you were saying, it, they used to be exempt because it was a tax haven. Now they're going to, uh, you know, relinquish this, uh, this event and 15% uh, of their annual budget is going to come from doing that. And it's not even been ruled upon by the IRS to actually be legal. So, you know, How can it, they do that? it's basically it's... a tax haven. Yes, basically. Well, they've done it because uh, the federal government knows that, uh, you know, there's a fix, you know, that they would have to, you know, bail out Puerto Rico yeah. unless uh, they got this money from the, uh, from the companies. So these companies are, are, are paying for what used to be a tax haven. Does this deal suggest that there are some serious problems with the state of affairs in Puerto Rico today? Definitely. You know, you have 14 percent unemployment uh, and, uh, you know, without this uh, potential deal that uh, reneges on the tax exemption, they'd probably be defaulting on some of the bonds. And the interesting bit is, is that they're, they're rated uh, investment grade. Right. 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 Yeah, they're as best as you can get, but so is everything. It's not, this, these, are, these are not junk deals. So, so was Lehman at the time of the collapse, so we all know I, those rating agencies. Always trust them. That's all the time for now. Ed, you're fantastic as always, but you can see all segments featured in today's show on YouTube at youtube.com slash boombustrt. We also love hearing from you, so please check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash boombustrt. You can also tweet at us at Aaron Aid, at Edward NH from all of us here at Boombust. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Ciao.